Actually Speaking, Episode 9, The Art of Listening. Want to know how to live skeptically and still have friends? So do I. Let's figure it out. Actually Speaking, a podcast that explores the human side of skepticism, critical thinking, and the skills we need to make it through the day. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Episode 9 of Actually Speaking, a podcast that sets the science aside and explores the human side of skepticism. My name is Mike Moraz, and today we're going to learn about a very important aspect of communication that often gets overlooked, listening. Specifically, a more interactive form of listening called active listening. Most of the time, when people talk to each other, we're not very attentive to what's being said. We're only partially listening and very often distracted by things in our environment, our own thoughts, or we're thinking ahead of how we can respond in order to win an argument. We hear very little of what's being said because our focus is usually on ourselves. Simply put, active listening is a structured way of listening and responding to another person that improves mutual understanding by focusing attention on the speaker. It isn't passive at all. In fact, it's extremely interactive. When a person is listening actively, they eliminate distractions and focus on the speaker in order to understand the message. They actively respond to the speaker in a variety of ways that we'll discuss to both convey their understanding of what's being said as well as to clarify any misunderstandings on the spot. If done well, active listening actually encourages further disclosure. It builds trust and helps each participant not only understand the content of what's being said, but the context as well. Active listening is the counterpart to I statements, which we learned about in the previous episode. Together, they form the foundation for effective interpersonal communication. The best way to think about active listening that is the most helpful in understanding why it fits in with the goals of skepticism and the promotion of critical thinking is to view the active listening as a mirror. We want people to be able to make informed decisions with minimal bias, but we also need for people to make those decisions themselves. There are two ways of doing this. So far, we've talked about the ways in which we can share factual information by creating an environment in which people can feel more comfortable and open to receiving information. But active listening is another way of sharing information. What makes it different is that it's a process of reflecting back to a person their own beliefs in order for them to see those beliefs more clearly and objectively. Listening is to communication exactly what a mirror is to getting ready in the morning. A good active listener serves as an added tool for an individual to evaluate information. We enable people to see themselves and their beliefs from a new perspective we become a tool for self-examination by reflecting back a speaker's beliefs, positions, and decisions with a clarity and perspective that none of us can achieve on our own. That's the real value of active listening in any situation. We become, each of us, mirrors for each other. So why is listening such an important part of communication? Well, because listening promotes a mutual understanding rather than simply a one-way flow of information. We listen both to receive information, but also to help others feel valued, diffuse tension, and promote a shared involvement in the conversation. Most of the time, our natural tendency is to argue and debate. But very often, when we make an effort to listen actively, it can serve as a pressure release valve for a conversation and lays the groundwork for better communication in both directions. But I want to clarify up front that listening to someone doesn't imply agreement. That's a big misconception that we intuitively make and something that we really need to be aware of and move beyond. Just because you let someone have their say doesn't mean you're agreeing with them. When you look at the news, political debates, or anything in the media that's presenting opposing viewpoints, what inevitably happens is that people stop listening and begin talking over each other, usually with the intent of not allowing the opposing message to be heard. This is an effective communication, yet this is what we're constantly exposed to and behavior that is, unfortunately, reinforced. Debates often devolve down into who was the most forceful rather than who made the best argument. People don't want to take their turn. They don't even want to allow someone to have an opportunity to speak when there is disagreement. When we remove listening from the equation, communication shuts down, and it usually reflects negatively on us. 
If our first tendency is to shut people down automatically, we actually provide them with a defense for their position. They can make the claim that they couldn't speak, weren't heard, or had no opportunity to make their argument. It creates the misconception that information they're trying to share is trying to be hidden, which might only serve to pique the curiosity of others and fuel conspiracy beliefs. It may also give the impression that we're threatened by their information, and that's not the impression we want to give. We want to communicate from a position of confidence. And if we're confident and we realize that our position, message, and the facts are not threatened by a faulty interpretation, then let them speak. Let others share what they have to say. It really shouldn't be a problem. Let people talk. Let them get their message out regardless of how flawed it may be. It's in our best interest to do so. Listening promotes transparency in our communication, and that, in turn, projects confidence in our own positions. The other person feels better, it makes you look good, and then the discussion can continue more calmly and hopefully based on facts and with continued disclosure. We want people to open up about their positions and beliefs. We want those beliefs to see the light of day in order to help both parties gain perspective on those beliefs and in order to better inform their decision making. We achieve this through listening. When we think about the act of listening, it's usually in terms of a very passive and one-sided experience. It's really not. We listen for a lot of reasons, and they're not always what we may expect. I think traditionally, we listen in order to obtain information, to understand someone or something, for enjoyment or to learn. But these aren't the only reasons we listen to others. In fact, the reasons for listening go well beyond these basic benefits. When we engage in active listening, we accomplish much, much more than this. We also build trust with others. We strengthen our relationships. We create conditions for growth and for change. We achieve greater efficiency and productivity toward our goals. We increase our ability to influence, to persuade and negotiate. We avoid conflicts and misunderstandings that often derail communication. There are tremendous benefits to listening to others actively instead of the more common passive approach. But to do so, we need to expand our understanding of what a listening skill is and how to make it active. So what does the process of active listening look like? Well, different sources will describe it in a variety of ways, but I think it's easiest to break it down into five simple stages. Like I statements, this is simply a learning model for active listening, which needs to be adapted for real conversations. Oh, and remember, active listening skills do play a role in more formal and public discourse, such as debates and interviews, but for our discussion, we're talking about more private communication with family and friends. So here are the five stages. One, pay attention. Two, show you're listening. Three, provide feedback. That's the tricky one. Four, defer judgment. And five, respond appropriately. Fortunately, these stages are very intuitive and fairly easy to implement as long as you remember to use them. And that's really the key. So let's go through each of them briefly to make sure you fully understand each step and the role it plays in a conversation. The first stage, pay attention. Pretty obvious, right? But easily forgotten. Simply give the speaker your undivided attention by eliminating or minimizing distractions. Make eye contact. Set aside distracting thoughts. Don't mentally begin formulating your response. Avoid being distracted by other people or side conversations. Pay attention to the speaker's body language for clues on how they're feeling. Don't let appearance, mannerisms, personality, or quirks distract you from their message. Doing all these things usually instills a sense of trust and comfort in the speaker, which can minimize defensiveness and diffuse conflicts. Stage 2. Show you're listening. Your attentiveness in the first step, paying attention, can be significantly reinforced by simple body language and verbal cues. Remember, even though you are attentive, the other person can't read your mind. So actively showing your attentiveness is extremely helpful. Very simple things can make a big impact. Not occasionally. Use verbal cues like, uh-huh, I see. Or, I can certainly relate to that. Smile. And use other facial expressions. Don't look bored. Make sure your posture and your own body language is open and inviting. For example, lean forward and don't fold your arms. 
It isn't enough to simply pay attention. We need to make sure the speaker is reminded of our attentiveness with verbal and visual cues. Stage three, provide feedback. This is the primary active step in the active listening process. And also the part where we often mess things up by injecting our own opinions, positions, and judgments. There will be time for that, but we need to let the listening process continue and complete. Your goal in this step is to clarify what you're hearing and reflect that information back. Identify areas of misunderstanding and probe for additional information that can help your mutual understanding. Now, there are a few ways we can provide feedback. One is to simply reflect. Simply restate what a person has shared. It's a simple way to let them know that you heard what they said. Another way to provide feedback is to paraphrase. Test your understanding of what they've shared by stating it in your own words. Something like, what I'm hearing is... Or, it sounds as if you're saying, if there are misunderstandings, the speaker will point them out. And it helps the speaker to see if they're communicating their thoughts clearly. Another way of providing feedback is to summarize. People can ramble on quite a bit in a conversation and lose track of their thoughts. Help them out by summarizing periodically to check for understanding and help them keep focused. There's nothing like a quick summary statement to nudge a person to wrap up or simplify a thought. And yet another way of providing feedback is to ask questions. Nothing shows attentiveness more than a clarifying or probing question. If something is unclear, ask. For example, what exactly do you find harmful about a flu shot? Or, I'm curious why you've chosen not to use herbal remedies with your daughter's asthma. Non-judgmental questions help us clarify a speaker's message, both for ourselves and for them. Providing feedback while listening is the heart of the word active and active listening. Not only does it demonstrate our attentiveness to the speaker, it provides clarity, avoids confusion, achieves greater focus, and prevents misunderstandings. It doesn't mean you agree with what's being said. It simply provides accuracy for what is being said and for your eventual response. The fourth stage is to defer judgment. This step is simply a reminder to hold your horses. Don't interrupt or rush in with your counter-argument. Interrupting only frustrates the speaker and limits your understanding. Let them finish and express your appreciation for what they've shared. It may be hard, but the process of listening actively and allowing the speaker a natural and uninterrupted end to their thoughts will earn you a great deal of goodwill and set a receptive stage for your response, which is the final stage. Stage five, respond appropriately. This is your opportunity to now respond to the information that's been shared. Not only have you gained information from the speaker, but you've gained perspective, emotions, and a context for that information. Use that insight in your response. Be open and honest, but assert your opinions respectfully. This is where your skill with I statements comes into use. Your ability to share your own thoughts, beliefs, and positions in a respectful and constructive manner completes this cycle of communication. So, let's review. Active listening involves five simple steps. One, pay attention. Two, show that you're listening. Three, provide feedback. Four, defer judgment. And five, respond appropriately. I statements and active listening are the challenge and support of communication. Each are fairly impressive in and of themselves, but their true impact can only be felt when used together. This is the cycle of communication that we ideally want to master in order to effectively interact with those who hold different beliefs and positions from our own. We challenge others with our thoughts, ideas, and perspectives. We support them with our ability to listen and understand their views. Nowhere in this process do we need to agree, back down from our positions, or diminish them in any way. The growth, learning, and change that we're seeking comes from the manner in which we interact. The concept of listening may not initially seem like it's tied to skepticism or the promotion of critical thinking. You might think to yourself, hey, this is great for a marriage, family conflict, or a workplace problem, 
But how does this really benefit skepticism? Well, intuitively, we may think that sharing factual information is a one-way process instead of an exchange of information. If we're promoting science and have agreed upon facts to share, what's the point of listening? Well, the point is not just to communicate scientific facts. Let's face it, if the communication of facts were all that this was about, we'd be much better off just handing people textbooks. But that isn't how human growth or change works. The reality is, our communication of factual information, our promotion of critical thinking and skepticism, is very much embedded within our relationships. Who we are and how we relate to each other impacts what we learn and how we grow. Communication and our relationships are part of the equation of learning and therefore essential components to skeptical outreach. Here's some examples of what we can gain from active listening. Now, I'm basing them simply on listener feedback that I've received since the beginning of this podcast. By listening to someone, we might learn that their anti-vaccination position really isn't as strong as we first thought. What we once thought was a strong anti-vax agenda was actually coming from a simple state of confusion and fear stirred up by the media. By listening to someone, we might learn that a person's draw to homeopathy has less to do with a belief in the power of dilution and more to do with the insecurity stemming from a lack of formal education in a family filled with advanced degrees. By listening to someone, we might learn that claims of psychic abilities have less to do with a belief in the supernatural and more to do with a strong desire to deal with personal pain and loss. By listening to someone, we might learn that their promotion of herbal and alternative remedies has less to do with a distrust in Big Pharma and more to do with their struggles as a single parent and needing a flexible means of putting food on the table. By listening to someone, we might learn that their rejection of evolution has less to do with their belief in God and more to do with a spouse's fundamentalist beliefs and a desire to keep a family and marriage from falling apart. If we truly want to serve as a catalyst for growth in others and open people's minds to the benefits of critical thought, we need to move beyond the what of a conversation and also understand the why. We need to make sure our interactions not only have the benefit of reliable content, but also the appropriate context. Our beliefs, opinions, and positions exist in a very complex gray area, constantly agitated and distorted by our interactions with each other. Listening, as part of a healthy process of communication, helps us understand the context in which beliefs and decisions are made by family and friends so we can better understand and help each other make better decisions. In the next episode, we're going to learn about skeptical support structures for when living that skeptical lifestyle becomes just a bit too challenging. If you have questions, comments, or would like to share your own tips and ideas on living skeptically, send them to actuallyspeaking at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash factually. Thanks for listening. It explores the human side of skepticism. My name is Mike Mraz, and today we're going to learn about a very important aspect of communication that often gets overlooked, listening. Specifically, a more interactive form of listening called active listening. Most of the time, when people talk to each other, we're not very attentive to what's being said. We're only partially listening and very often distracted by things in our environment, our own thoughts, or we're thinking ahead of how we can... Actually speaking, Episode 9, The Art of Listening. Want to know how to live skeptically and still have friends? So do I. Let's figure it out. Actually Speaking, a podcast that explores the human side of skepticism, critical thinking, and the skills we need to make it through the day. Hi everyone, and welcome to Episode 9 of Actually Speaking, a podcast that sets the science aside and respond in order to win an argument. We hear very little of what's being said because our focus is usually on ourselves. Simply put, active listening is a structured way of listening and responding to another person that improves mutual understanding by focusing attention on the speaker. It isn't passive at all. In fact, it's extremely interactive. When a person is listening actively, they eliminate distractions and focus on the speaker in order to understand the message. They actively respond to the speaker in a variety of ways that we'll discuss to both convey their understanding of what's being said as well as to clarify any misunderstandings on the spot. 
If done well, active listening actually encourages further disclosure. It builds trust and helps each participant not only understand the content of what's being said, but the context as well. Active listening is the counterpart to I statements, which we learned about in the previous episode. Together, they form the foundation for effective interpersonal communication. The best way to think about active listening that is the most helpful in understanding why it fits in with the goals of skepticism and the promotion of critical thinking is to view the active listening as a mirror. We want people to be able to make informed decisions with minimal bias. 